George Helmuth had a, an appointment to speak to a small rural school board a few hours drive from St. Louis in a small town in Missouri. And he brought along uh, one of his assistants, the name, name is King Graff. George and King went to this grade school where the interview was to be held. It was for grade K through three or K through five, something like that. So the hallway had these little tiny kids chairs. And both of them knew that the interview was taking place in one of the classrooms because they could hear behind the door. So they sat there on these little kitty chairs with their knees up to their chins. And in those days, architects took big portfolios with them, big leather or leather leatherette cases to show their renderings of their projects and so on. And as Helmus sat there, he listened and he heard the voice of somebody he knew. It was another architect from St. Louis that was being interviewed before Helmuth. And Helmuth had learned through the grapevine that this other firm was had the inside track and was probably going to be selected. So he didn't like that too much. So when the time came, seven o'clock, Helmut sat there with his looking at his wristwatch. And when the second hand swept up to seven o'clock sharp, he got up out of his little chair, went to the classroom door and banged on the door. Blam, 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 blam. And all the conversation in the classroom stopped for a minute. And then it resumed. So he knocked again, blam, blam, blam. And finally, somebody came to the door and opened it and said, Mr. Helmuth, we'll be right with you. Helmuth didn't stop. He barged right through the door, walked into this other interview with his competitor and said, hi, I'm George Helmuth. I'm here for my seven o'clock interview. You know, we're the best. We know we're the best. So why don't you just give us this damn job <laughs> and turn around and left. And when King Graff told the story over the years, somebody would always say, well, King, did we get the job? And King would always laugh and he'd say, no, we didn't get that one. <laughs> My name is Mark R. LePage, and I'm joined by Patrick McLaney, FAIA, and former CEO of the international architecture firm, HOK. This is Build Smart. Patrick shares stories from his remarkable 50-year career at HOK, rising from junior designer to CEO of the company. With themes of leadership, finance, people, culture, and so much more, you'll find that there's a lesson in every episode. Welcome back to Build Smart. In our last episode, Patrick highlighted George Helmuth and the origin of his principles for what he referred to as the Depression Proof Firm. If you haven't listened to that episode, I encourage you to go back and listen to all the episodes in order to hear Patrick's full story and insights into how to design a world-class architecture firm. In today's episode, the founding of HOK. Hey so in the last episode, we spoke about George Helmuth and his coming up through architecture and working with SHG and this idea of the depression-proof firm and resigning because they had no interest in what he was doing. So where did George go? What did Helmuth do after resigning from SHG? It's a great story, actually. He had become very good friends as I mentioned earlier, with Minoru Yamasaki, the young designer that he had recruited from New York. And he had also become very good friends with Joe Lineweber, who was a senior production architect at SHG. Even before George Helmuth got out of the building after resigning, he had a conversation with him in the hallway before he left and said, I'm going to form a new firm. I'd love for you to be my partners. What do you say? And within 10 minutes, they had agreed and they left with him. So they walked out the door, walked out the door with him. They walked out the door, established a new firm. And because Helmuth was the, the senior, he was the founder, his name got to be first. And it became Helmuth, Yamasaki, and Lineweber. Now there's a jawbreaker of a name. <laughs> but it was organized according to his principles. And the, he had brought them along with him. They both knew about his principles. He had discussed that over over the dinner table or over coffee uh, many times, as you would, as anyone would with their friends. So they knew what they were doing. It had never been really done before, but they were both intrigued by it. And I think quite taken with Helmuth's capacity as a leader. I talked to George Helmuth's son some years after this, and he said, you know, my father had two great strengths. One was he was a natural marketer. 
He loved people and he loved to become friends with people. But he also had an uncanny gift for picking out talent. He knew how to find the right person to fit in the right spot. So he picked Yamasaki and Lineweber. They went to another location in Detroit and set up Helmuth, Yamasaki, and Lineweber. It's a long, complicated name. The firm quickly became known as HYL. And uh, this was in 1949, just after the Second World War was finished. And there was a lot of work around. But the, almost the first thing Helmuth did after starting his new firm was he opened a branch office in St. Louis, where he was from. Why? Well, he had worked in St. Louis for the city for seven long years during the Depression. And he knew everybody. He knew everybody in the city, all the public works people. He knew the mayor. He knew the council members and so on. So he, even at that age, determined that HYL was going to be a different kind of firm, and it was going to be diversified by geography. So Helmuth began shuttling back and forth between the two cities, at first by train and later by air, and marketing in both locations. And he was successful in both locations. The firm got a good deal of work in Detroit and a great deal of work in St. Louis. And so Yamasaki and Lineweber found themselves also having to commute to St. Louis to oversee the work. And it wasn't long after the commute became long and and arduous, especially for Yamasaki, who was not in great health, uh, that Yamasaki decided he needed an assistant to help him in St. Louis. And so he reached out to uh, uh, John Dinkaloo, his personal friend of his, and said, I need to find a good young designer to help me. And Tinkaloo said, I know just the guy, name is Gio Obata, and uh, he went to Cranbrook Academy, and he's now working for SOM in Chicago. And uh, when he reached out to him and Gio came to Detroit to be interviewed, they both discovered that they had a lot in common. They were both Japanese American, and they were both Nisei. And Nisei means they were the firstborn in the United States of Japanese immigrant parents. Both were also from the West Coast. Yamasaki was from uh, Seattle and Obata was born in San Francisco and raised in Berkeley, California. So let me just tell you about Gyo. His parents were immigrants from Sendai, Japan, which is a town in the north of Japan. And they were both artisans. His father was a well-regarded artist, Kira Obata. And his mother brought the art of ikibana, or Japanese flower arranging, to the United States from Japan. Actually taught classes in her house, in her home in Berkeley. And Gio's father uh, was such a well-known artist that he, he secured a professorship at the University of California, Berkeley, and actually taught art. We introduced Kiku Obata, Gio Obata's daughter, in episode one. In her conversation with Patrick, she gave tremendous insight into Gyo and her family's history. My grandfather was born in Sendai, in that region, and he had an inclination towards art at a very early age, you know, at five or six, he was drawing and painting all the time. And his father was an incredible artist, but much more of a more European style. You know, I think at that time, I think there was a focus in Japan on artists, you know, European artists. and. We have some sketchbooks of, of, his name is Rokuichi, his sketchbooks, and they're very European style. And my grandfather was really painting more in a Japanese style. You know, at early age, he was uh, studying with masters. So I don't even think there was school, like, you know, there is school today. You would, if you had an inclination towards something that you were good at, you went and studied with a master. So he studied with several really good painters and around Sendai and then felt there was nothing more he could learn there. So he went to Tokyo and studied there. And this was when he was like 12 to 15. At one point he was studying with this master in Tokyo and he went to my great grandfather's house and he and my great grandfather had some sort of argument about something. And my grandfather stormed out to the this beautiful bamboo garden that they had and he took out his summer sort and chopped down half of the bamboo that was like centuries old and my great grandfather was you know his father was furious with him and he said go away go go to tokyo and leave and don't come back here until you painted ten thousand paintings 
So my grandfather went to Tokyo, studied there for a while, and then came to the United States. And I think it was in the 20s that my grandfather decided that he had painted 10,000 paintings and he would go back to Japan to make peace with him. And, and they were on a boat to go back to Japan. At the same time, there was a letter coming to him saying that his father had died. So it was like this tragic, terrible story. But, you know, I just, I have all these visual images of my grandfather with his samurai sword chopping down this bamboo. And I have an old photo of my grandfather and my father, actually, because they went back again when my dad was five. So my dad spent his, the year when he was five in Japan. And that's sort of where he learned how to speak Japanese. So, you know, it's this beautiful, very traditional Japanese house with shoji screens. And, you know, I just have all these visual images of that time. Your grandfather came to San Francisco. Did he meet your grandmother, Gio's mother? Here. My grandfather came in 1903 and then lived through that, the big San Francisco earthquake and subsequent fire. But he documented that through painting. And I think most of those paintings have been donated to the Smithsonian of his record. I think there's like a hundred drawings of the earthquake that are just these beautiful little sketch, you know, Sumi sketches. So he painted in watercolor and, and Sumi ink, but really modernized, you know, his, my grandfather's view of painting was much more, um, he sort of abstracted it a bit, you know, they're sort of closer views. They're not the sort of panoramic, more classic Japanese views of landscape. He predominantly painted landscape. And he came to the United States to go to Paris and came to Seattle and then came to San Francisco and just fell in love with San Francisco and fell in love with the whole Western landscape. You know, he went up to the Sierras and went to Yosemite and said, this is it. This is my place. I just love this place. And painted in Yosemite every year after that, I think, until he was pretty old. Well, in fact, Eo's recollection of going camping in Yosemite with yes. his mm -hmm. family mm -hmm. and his father had befriended the famous photographer, Ansel Adams. Yeah. And they would sit out in the evenings in Yosemite Valley and Curry Village and have a drink and talk about art and yeah. and photography. And they began to actually give classes mm -hmm. and put on shows together. That's right. So like your dad, your grandfather was also a person that befriended other people in, yes. in the arts. Yeah, there was always, I, I think my dad has learned that from his family. So my grandfather used to teach painting, you know, this is when I was young. So I, you know, I think this must have been after he retired from teaching at Cal. He was probably 70 then. So I would go and stay there in the summer and there would be this constant flow of people in the house. He would be teaching classes and my grandmother would be teaching Ikebana classes. And so there's like painting and flowers, like buckets of flowers everywhere and cherry blossom branches and it was just the most wonderful environment and his beautiful paintings everywhere. But, you know, it was a tiny, tiny house in Berkeley right off Telegraph, beautiful backyard that had a whole Japanese garden in it. And he had, my grandfather had this wall in the back that had probably over a hundred bonsai plants on it. Gio told me that his father had had this collection of bonsai trees that he loved and he took care of. Yes. And somebody came by yes. and stole them or, Right after my grandfather died. It was just horrible. Tragic. Like all of them. Every single one of them was gone. So your father was an architect, is an architect. Mm -hmm. Your mother was a weaver. Yes, still is. She still is. Your grandparents were an artist and an ikebana. And how about you and your siblings? So I'm, I'm a designer and I have a design firm here in St. Louis and a, and a little office in London. And my daughter in London runs my London office and she's um, more of a strategist. So she's not a, but she's a really good potter, although she doesn't do that right now. She has two little kids. And my other daughter who lives in Milwaukee is not an artist, but she does needlework. So she's very talented in that, but she works in baseball actually, which is another one of my, both my father and my grandfather's passion. Was, was baseball. Yeah. My grandfather started the first 
Japanese American baseball team in California. He is an avid, avid Giants fan. My God, he was I so. I did not know good. that. Oh, he would sit there and yell at the at the at the umpire. <laughs> <laughs> Just yell at the TV. You know, he had this little tiny black and white TV, and I'd be there in the summer watching because I'm a huge baseball fan too. Probably from both of them. But are you? You got to be a Cardinal fan. Yeah, I'm a Cardinal fan. Of course, Cardinal fan. Yeah. So they both would just sit there and yell at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so Kiko, can you just? Uh, I know this is probably painful, but just talk about. I know that Gio had enrolled in Cal to study architecture in 1941, mm-hmm. and in December of that year, of course, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and started yes. World War II. And uh, over a period of months after that, the president and Congress decreed that the Japanese Americans who lived in the three Western states needed to be interned for the duration of the war. It's a sad chapter. These were Americans, either naturalized or natural born. However, there was a provision in the internment law that said if a full-time student wants to continue his or her education, they can do so and get out of the camps, but they can't study in the three Western states, California, Oregon, Washington. They had to go east. And then what happened? So my dad, who was 19 at the time, just was totally into studying architecture. You know, he wanted to be an architect from when he was five years old. So anyway, he was at Cal studying. And my grandfather said, Gio, you need to look into this because this is going to be trouble. Something's going to happen. And there's talk that all the Japanese are going to get moved out of here. So dad applied to Wash U, which was the closest architecture school to California. And so he applied and, you know, fortunately was accepted. And then the night before all the Japanese were to be rounded up, the order was going to come out the next day. One of the, my grandfather had a friend who was a colonel in the army and he came over at that the night before and gave my dad a pass to get on a train to get out of California. So my dad like packed everything up and left on the train. And the next morning, everyone else was rounded up. So if he had been there, he wouldn't have been able to get out. Just by one day. By one day. Got yeah. Out. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was my grandfather pushing him because grandpa always said that Gio was just totally focused on his words. He said it had his head down, just drawing all day long and never looked up. Just drew all night, all day, all night. So, you know, it was my grandfather who really got him out of there. So so just by a whisker, he was able to leave the Bay Area and go on train, the, the train to St. Louis. He had never been east. He said, you know, in the Bay Area, all the buildings are made out of wood and they're painted in pastel light colors. And the further east he went on the train, the more the buildings were, were a mixture of wood and brick. And by the time he got to St. Louis, they were all brick. So he was in a different world. Yeah. The other thing that was really strange for my father is that when he came to St. Louis, he was just welcomed. You know, he said he experienced no prejudice in St. Louis. He always talks about it as prejudice versus racism. And he said he was welcomed and people were so kind to him. And there were three other Japanese American architecture students who came from California at the time. Um, Dick Hemney was one of them. And then that first Christmas, he was allowed to come and visit his family in, in the camp. And he came and stayed for two weeks. He stayed in the barracks with his family. And then after two weeks, he left and he said it was just, he just felt so horrible that he could leave. I, I mean, I think he felt guilty about that for the rest of his life, that he was able to leave and everybody else had to stay behind. It really had a huge impact on him. So Gio was seared in his own way. Helmuth was seared by the Great Depression. I think Gio was seared by the war and the treatment of Japanese Americans. So Gio got a very good grounding in architecture at Washington University. After graduating, Gio went to Cranbrook Academy in suburban Detroit. And Cranbrook was a, an academy for design of all kinds. So one of the striking things about my dad in terms of his architectural practice was really listening to a client and to understand the thoughts, but also the feelings. I think he was really good at reading people and, you know, he looked at body language, but he also really listened to every word. And I think sometimes those words trigger 
visual images for for designers that was really helpful so he he listened on multiple levels i think listened for feelings listened for things that would trigger images and listened for context too in a way that would help because dad was really interested in the site and the context and how everything fit together but i think that was one of the hallmarks of studying with saranen who really taught him to look at the whole don't think about a building or a form look at the whole what's the city what's the streets what are the buildings what are the you know down to the chair and who's the person sitting in the chair so i think that was really how he thought through in this very holistic sounds. Right. And by Saarinen, you mean Elio Saarinen, who was the founder of Cranbrook. Yes. And Gio, Gio talked about that a lot because he met people there that became lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. He always seemed to collect around him people that knew things and were artisans and mm -hmm. photographers and so on. Well, that, that was really the Cranbrook way. You know, I remember my dad told me that when he was at WashU, he had a choice. He said back then, which was in 45, you had a choice. You either went to Cranbrook and studied with Elil Saarinen, or you went to Harvard and studied with Gropius. Two completely different ways, but imagine that being your choice as a young architect back then. But he said he really loved Saarinen's vision, that it wasn't about the architect putting a building somewhere it was really about almost quite the opposite it was about the architect understanding the context and the people and the place and the client i remember he always used to talk about because i asked him what he learned from sarah and he did talk about context but he always used to say you know he dressed so well <laughs> <laughs> he was such a good dresser. He said, I really admired how he dressed. And my dad is, was an inc incredible dresser. I mean, he just, it was very important to him how he looked and the layering of fabrics and textures. And Cranbrook was really known for its holistic approach to all the di design disciplines and how they all come together. And I think, you know, my mom, who he met at Cranbrook, was a weaver and or still is a weaver. And, you know, he liked that there was a pottery studio there, there's a weaving studio, there's a furniture studio. And so I think he's always really thought in terms of this holistic experience of the people who will use the place. You know, it's not, here's the building. It's really about the experience of the place. Wow. So Kiku, and for, first of all, I did not know that story, that he had a choice of studying under Walter Gropius. Yeah, Herbert, isn't that amazing? Or under Saarinen. Wow. But I can I, I can see it in Gio. I can see it today that Gio was suited to the Saarinen approach. Absolutely. You look at, you consider everything. Mm -hmm. And Gropius was about defining a new technology and having buildings all fit into this new technology. Yes. But it was never Gio's way. No, it was much more systems and buildings. Mm -hmm. I think it led Gio to evolve not a style because his buildings were different. You couldn't look at a building and say, oh, those are Gio Obata buildings. Mm -hmm. He let each building evolve from, again, that conversation, that listening to that client. Uh, by this time, World War II was over, but the Korean War was just, it was imminent. So he got drafted into the army. And uh, after basic training, his platoon was dispatched to Adak Island, in the Aleutian chain, Alaska. And Gio didn't know where ADAC was or what it was like. So he asked one of his buddies, he said, what's ADAC like? And these are a series of volcanic islands that stretch from Alaska all the way over to Russia. And uh, his buddy said, oh, you're going to love it. There's a girl behind every tree. And when Gio got there, he discovered that ADAC was treeless. There wasn't a tree in sight. You know, they all had metal cots and each one of the guys had like a picture of Betty Grable and my dad had a picture of a Franklin Wright building. <laughs> 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 so he didn't even really care about the girls behind the trees. <laughs> An architect through and through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then after, after he finished with the army, he needed a job and he ended up getting a job at SOM in Chicago. And he worked there a couple of years before Yamasaki reached out to him. So Gio went to work for Yamasaki in the St. Louis office of HYL. And that's how Gio came to be in a firm where Helmuth was already uh, working. 
So now we hear about Gio Obata, the O in H-O-K. There's a K in H-O-K, George Kassebaum. So how does George Kassebaum find his way to H-Y-L? Well, George Kassebaum, and again, each one of these men has an interesting, different story. Kassebaum was also not from St. Louis. He was from Kansas, the prairie of Kansas. And he grew up in a series of uh, succession of small towns in Kansas where his father was an official with the YMCA. So they moved around a bit. But early in his life, George saw a church in this one town where they lived. He walked by it on his way to school, and he thought it was the most beautiful building he had ever seen. Came home that day and announced to his parents, I want to grow up and be an architect and design beautiful buildings. And he never wavered from that. So when he finished high school, his, his mother helped him look for university or colleges that offered architecture. And he was an only child, so his mother wanted him fairly close to home and, and uh, suggested St. Louis was a pretty close to Kansas in this really good, small private school. Washington University was there. So she got George enrolled in Washington University in St. Louis. So all three founders went to the same university for undergraduate work. George Kassebaum thrived at school. And he found he was a naturally organized kind of student. And he seemed to breeze through his studies. He eventually uh, discovered that his real passion and his real uh, abilities were in the production work, organizing the project so that it, it was projects could be built by a contractor. And uh, after graduation, he didn't join HOK initially. He was invited to join the faculty. So he was on the Washington University faculty for some years before finally the same thing that happened to Gio is that Joe Lineweber needed an assistant in St. Louis to help him run the production in the office. They had a big project then, the design of the new St. Louis Lambert Airport Terminal. St. Louis Lambert International Airport is one of the most historic airports in the United States. Opened in 1956, the terminal design is a modular system that allowed for later expansion. The feature element a copper-cladded, vaulted concrete roof is a series of intersecting, arched structures that from the interior gave the feeling of flight. Architectural Forum magazine once referred to the terminal as the Grand Central of the Air. The building is dressed in expansive glass facades that flood the interior with natural light. The soaring arched ceilings of this terminal made for a dramatic experience, becoming the forerunner to many of the other iconic modern airline terminals such as the TWA terminal at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York and the Dulles Washington Airport terminal in Washington, D.C. Now at last, all three men are working in the same firm. I had already mentioned to you that Yamasaki in particular was not happy with the commute in part because he wasn't in good health. He had some ulcers and some other issues. So one day he came to St. Louis and had lunch with Helmuth at the uh, Statler Hotel and said, George, I've got this really good idea. I think we ought to just close St. Louis up, have you move back to Detroit and you can market for me in Detroit. Well, Helmut did not like that at all. What Yama really wanted was somebody to bring in signature projects for him to design. And uh, what Helmut wanted was completely different. He said, there's a good design opportunity in any building, every building, and diversity is our strength. So after that lunch, Helmuth went back to the HYL St. Louis office, and much as he did in SHG office in Detroit, he pulled Gio Obata and George Casabon aside and said, Gio, George, how would you like to be my partners in a new office, in a new firm? George said it took about two seconds for them to say yes. So he went back to Yamasaki, and again, they were partners and they were friends, and they had a very amicable agreement to split the firm down the middle. Yamasaki would take the Detroit office and Lineweber would stay with Yama and George Helmuth would take on the St. Louis office and he promoted Gio and George Kassebaum to be his partners there. Yamasaki went back to Detroit. He did not keep Lineweber on, his, on the nameplate. He, he changed the name to Monero Yamasaki and Associates and went on to have a brilliant career designed many well-known buildings, uh, most notably the World Trade Center in New York City. I was with Papa George Helmuth 
one day, many years before 9-11, we were in New York City calling on a client in a cab. And we were driving down one of the, one of the streets. We came across one of the big avenues of New York, and you could see down the avenue. And there were the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center just glistening in the afternoon sun. And Helmuth, who was never a shy man, told the cab, stop the cab. And the cabbie didn't know what was happening. So the cabbie pulled over and George says, ah, come on out, I want you to see something. So I got out and he pointed down the avenue and there I could see the World Trade Center. He said, see, see that? Yes, that's the World Trade Center. He said, my old partner Yamasaki designed those and I'm proud of it. But did you know that I had to stamp the drawings for that son of a bitch, the first building he ever designed? <laughs> because he wasn't registered yet. That's a quote. That's a funny story. He was an earthy guy, Helmuth. He loved Yamasaki, but if Yamasaki didn't want to practice the way Helmuth wanted, it was okay. They respected each other, but they wanted to go a different direction. And uh, true to form, you know, Yamasaki's office or firm lasted during his lifetime. And when he passed away, I think that was the end of the Yamasaki office. Helmuth did not want that. He wanted a firm that would live out and grow beyond the founders. HOK has been born, and Helmuth and Obata and Kasabam are partners. They're moving forward on George Helmuth's principles, building this firm the way that George wants it built, uh, with two partners who uh, agree and, and want to build that, that type of firm. And you, you just told the story about you and George Helmuth in New York City. So when did you enter the story here with HOK? Yeah, I, I joined the firm in 1967, and the firm was 12 years old. So what was the firm like when you joined it? It had grown. Oh, my, had it grown. Uh, from an original staff of about 14, which was the HYL office. When I joined HOK 12 years later, they had 150 people. So it was a big office for that time period. Big office, but still only one office. Still just one. That would change soon enough. And I was bowled over by how electric it was inside and how much innovation was going on with the encouragement of the, of the principals, the partners. Things were happening in every department that were, to me, like a dream. Like nobody showed me this or taught me this in school that you could actually draw outside the lines and create a firm that innovates like this. In my design department under Obata Designers typically would draw something freehand on a piece of tracing paper, which is uh, not expensive, and then put another piece of paper over it and try a little variation on that. He insisted that we keep all the paper in a pile in order. And when he came around to our desk to look at our work, if he didn't like the drawing that was on the top, he'd pull the, the top one off and keep pulling them off until he got to the place where he thought it had merit. And he'd say, now you work on that one. And also in, in the design department, Everybody, and I mean everybody, built models. At our desk, there was a model shop across the street, staffed by a couple of people with all the tools for making models. And we could make anything from a study model to a finished model in that shop. So Gio never really wanted to see uh, a building just in drawings. He insisted that we have models. The much more classical design thinking that insists that if you see it in three dimensions in a model, you can actually understand it. Gio always said there's a connection between the hand and the eye. And if you build something with your hands, you're going to understand it better than if, if you just draft it up or if you now use your mouse and your keyboard and draw it on a computer. So there's something about that that brings out the artisan in people. I think that's the other thing about my dad is that he has such a strong sense of aesthetics. I mean, I remember hearing him talk about materials, and I have a huge interest in materials. So I always sort of gravitated to when he was talking about that, but he would pull these pallets of materials that were just beautiful. And, and he would even like on his house and the houses that I lived in that he designed, and they were just spectacularly spare and beautiful and well thought through. And I, I think he actually learned a lot of that from Saarinen, but he really had a very refined sense of aesthetics. I remember him talking about the materials in the centene lobby, you know, the marble and the wood and the glass and the art. But I think that's one other thing that I think is a hallmark of HOK was 
I think HOK was the very first firm to have the other disciplines in-house. So there was interiors, there was lighting, there was graphics, which is how I got entered into the firm. There was a photographer on staff, there was landscape, and there was a real intention to integrate all those disciplines from the very beginning of a project. I remember my dad working on Bristol School, which was one of the very early elementary schools HOK did, and he would talk about all the different things coming together, the landscape, the color. I remember Bristol had these great graphics on the wall, these triangular shapes on the facade of the school, but it was all very tailored to the children who would be in the school, and the scale of everything was at a child scale. But the, you know, the interiors and the materials and the graphics and everything worked together. And I think that's, that was a really essential part of differentiating HOK in the early days of their work. It was so pulled together, you know, like a well-dressed guy like my dad, it was all pulled together. And I think that was really important to him. I think he really saw that and that was what he learned at Cranbrook. I think that came directly from Cranbrook and sort of that Bauhaus mentality of everything down to the cup and saucer on your table is really thought through. You know, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I think that's exactly right, that his studio at HOK mm -hmm. was a little recreation of Cranbrook. Yeah, it was. It absolutely was. Getting all those disciplines together. Absolutely. It's about thinking all those people. I think the best ideas happen when designers sit around the table and just talk about it. It's not even drawing. It's just talking about it. What's the idea here? And, you know, the best idea could come from a landscape person or a colorist or the, you know, he would have the materials person. That inspires creativity. It, it, it's, you know, it foments curiosity and and it makes people really think about it and you know you start to trigger ideas when you're all talking about that and i think that's what made those really early projects really interesting you know priory and planetarium and the schools and the you could just tell every detail was really thought through in marketing helma subscribed to a clipping service and the clipping service would send him literally clippings out of the newspapers of any firm that mentioned the word construction or expansion or growth or design. And uh, he had his secretary organize the clippings by region, and he would go to a region and call on these clients. And sometimes, uh, he again, I mentioned earlier that he was an early proponent of using air travel. In those early days, he would sometimes impress clients just by showing up at their office. You mean all the way from St. Louis? He was fond of... Uh, putting pins on a map, a map of the United States, eventually a map of the world. He would put a pin by every office or every, no, every client he had called on, and then a red pin for every project that he secured. And pretty soon there were blue pins for HOK offices and so on. And he delighted in that. And he used it as a conversation piece. When people came to HOK for a meeting, he would bring them into his office and it was a conversation piece. That's, there's the client for this and the project for that and so on. And so that was the, the innovation that he, he had of full-time marketing. And by then, his farming analogy of planting the seeds and tilling the fields and so on, that had run along. And there was a steady stream of new work that was a result of his marketing prowess. And by the time I joined, he had gotten some assistance, some people to help him market that uh, had an affinity for people. And he always said, if you want somebody to be your client, first, they have to be your friend. You have to build a bond of trust. If they don't trust you, you won't get the work. And even if you do get the work, if the bond of trust isn't there, if you run into a problem during the project, that bond of trust uh, is what's going to sustain you and get you through that rough patch. In production, George Kassebaum's area, uh, there were any number of good things. I'll just tell you one innovation. When architects used to draw buildings by hand on drafting paper, and how you did your detailing was always a trick. And at the firms I worked for before I graduated from college, summer, summer jobs, they would start detailing in the upper left corner of a detail sheet, and one detail would follow after another with no 
logic about how they all fit. Did this detail have anything to do with the detail right next to it? Or maybe the last detail on the sheet was drawn at a low, small scale because there wasn't enough room left. And we don't want to waste paper on another sheet. Kassebaum's department had this idea that they could do freehand details if they drew them at a large enough scale. They had grid paper where the grid would not print with a printer. And they were able to draw, some of them were quite good at it, freehand detail. And you could tell they were hand-drawn, but they were quite accurate and crisp. And if you drew a detail big enough, you could see things better and you could not avoid covering up obvious detail mistakes. You had to actually solve the detail. So the people that innovated in Kassbaum's department developed three sets of detail sheets. One was an eight and a half by 11, one was 11 by 17, and another one was half a sheet. And the details were drawn on those sheets, one sheet per detail. And toward the end of production, the project architect who was in charge of that project would get the sheets out of the detail drawer and tape them up with scotch tape, basically, on a big sheet of mylar, then send them to the printer, and the printer would make a new mylar. And so the result would be detail sheets where all the details were arranged exactly as you would want them, it's so they related to one another. They were drawn at a big enough scale, and they didn't worry about how many sheets it took. Printing is cheap, people are expensive and mistakes on construction jobs are the most expensive of all. So that was going on. I had never seen anything like that. And the freehand detailing, why that? Well, they discovered that if they drew freehand, they were more fluid. They didn't fall in love with their drafting job. Often uh, in those days, draftsmen would fall in love with their work, didn't want to erase it too much because it was so pretty. So we all knew that Details are not art in themselves, although I guess they could be. They're instructions to a contractor. So if you can overcome the natural human tendency to think of a drawing as so precious, you can actually quickly lay another sheet of paper over a detail, draw a corrected detail on it freehand quickly, and get it taped up on a detail sheet. So I had never seen anything like that. Uh, it was written up extensively in the architectural magazines in the 60s. So it was a marvelous place, and uh, I felt I was in a big, giant family with my friends. It sounds like a great place to work. It was a fantastic place to work. I, I was so surprised. Again, my plan was to work there a couple of years, take my license exam, get registered, and then go somewhere. And um, what I found was there was this great attractiveness to working in this place where there was a lot of innovation going on where people treated each other, each other like friends. Was there something unique about that culture that made it a place where you really wanted to work? Well, I didn't know it at the beginning, but I came to understand it very well over the period of time that, well, many years that I spent there. Um, I said it was like a big family, and it was. But actually, uh, my colleagues and I came to call it HOK culture. And it was, I think, very special. And HOK culture was, we're all in this as a big team. We're going to be collaborators and best friends inside this firm, helping each other to succeed. We're not going to be climbing over the top of each other to get ahead. And I heard this hundreds of times. At HOK, we collaborate inside so that we can compete outside. So I had many people in the firm, older designers, older production people and managers, helping me along my path, my journey. You also didn't hear open criticism. If somebody did something wrong, they were called in behind some closed door somewhere and told by one of the, the leaders. However, if somebody did something well, that was publicly praised. At Friday events or just Gio coming down and saying, hey, everybody in the design studio, look at this, look at what so-and-so did. So I felt as if the leaders of the firm not only wanted to attract and keep people, but they also wanted us to really feel that, feel that they were like the leaders of this big family. In those early days in St. Louis, all the innovation in the world that was happening at the firm, I would say was take second place to that HOK culture of we're gonna treat each other well. I think the innovation maybe was 
a result of the culture where people had permission to try things. They weren't on pins and needles waiting for somebody to step on them. Was that culture formalized in some way, in the way that the ownership was set up? Because it sounds very much like George Helmuth is executing on his plan to build this firm. You told the story about Yamasaki. When Yamasaki passed away, his firm ended. Right. George didn't want that to happen to his firm. So he's putting together all of these different pieces for his firm to thrive and continue to grow beyond them. Was there something in the culture or in the ownership structure itself that helped that as well? Well, let me talk about the ownership structure because it is different and it was revolutionary for its time. I mean, most architects, even today, are partnerships. HOK was founded as a corporation and instead of having partnership shares, people had stock. Of course, originally, only the three founders had the stock and uh, originally, Helmuth had 51% of the shares as a senior member and Guillaume and George had 24.5% of the, of the rest. Um, And that they changed that pretty quickly. They were all evenly endowed with shares after a few years. But by the time I arrived in 12 years later, they were preparing to spread out the stock ownership within the firm. Uh, If you think of stock, well, what is that? You have to buy it. You don't get it. You have to buy it. So the founders arranged for the first sale of stock to employees to a small group of, I think, 20 people. And I was on that list somehow after being there a few years. And uh, I didn't have any money. How could I buy stock? Well, they arranged with Boatman's Bank in St. Louis, which was the bank for the firm at the time, to extend a loan to any employee that was buying stock. And the loan was guaranteed basically by HOK. And the loan could be paid off by a payroll deduction over a period of, I think, five years. So within a few years of joining HOK, I was a shareholder. And I only had a few shares. I didn't quite know what it meant, but it was the beginning of understanding that, oh, I'm now part owner in this firm. There's some significance to that. I'm not just waiting for one of the partners to retire and have somebody else move up the ladder so that I can move up. This firm is organized differently. And they set it up deliberately as a corporation because corporations don't have a lifetime. They can go on as long as they're solvent and as long as there's a business to operate. So HOK has always been a corporation and continues to this day. So the stock is kept within active employees. But, uh, you know, as the firm has grown, the value of the stock has become a very good investment. And people have come to realize, oh, the firm, if the firm is well run and it doesn't live and die with the founders, It can be a good long-term investment that I can put money in as a young employee and sell that stock back as a someone who's retiring or in my case, repurposing. And it's worth quite a bit of money. So a lot of people have built good wealth because of this feature. And I think it's another one of the innovations of Helmuth. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, it it sounds very innovative. I mean, just the idea of having a corporation with an architecture firm so far back and understanding that and recognizing that that was a way that they could establish the organization of this company, this entity that would be separate from the partners, right? The entity is separate from yes. the partners and so it can live beyond the partners. And so there's this an innovation is in place and the, the culture that you're talking about is in place at HOK. But one of the things that I've, I'm noticing here is that you're still in St. Louis, right? They, one of the principles is to diversify location. And so you're still in St. Louis. So what did HOK do next to grow that firm beyond St. Louis? Yes, it wasn't long after I arrived that things began to happen. Uh, I myself uh, was, after a couple of years, was dispatched to a project office at Pittsburgh. But project offices are there, they're temporary just for the duration. Um, after being in Pittsburgh a year, my, my design boss, Bill Valentine, who became later my partner, um, asked me if I would move to San Francisco. San Francisco? I had never been west of Denver. And they, I said, well, what's going on there? I said, well, we're opening a new office. Uh, we got a little job for Stanford University to design a new library. But the office also now has got a lot of work in Alaska. Alaska. San Francisco got established that way. Eventually, 
got our first, you know, real projects, I think, in the city three years after that. But it, again, it's like plowing that field. It takes time. You have to have staying power. Almost after we got started, the HOK opened up an office on the East Coast in Washington, D.C. Helmuth loved to fly. He would fly to, to Washington to call on government agencies. He would call on the State Department. He also called on the uh, Smithsonian. And he was able to, after many visits, was able to secure a great prize for HOK, which was the design of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. on the Mall. Uh, But again, it required opening an office in Washington, D.C. And uh, both San Francisco and Washington are still vibrant HOK offices. They got their start from winning some work and by different ways. Dallas, Texas was our next office. Dallas came about as a result of the Dallas airport client. The Dallas-Fort Worth airport was being created. And the new director of the airport liked Lambert Field, which Gio and, and Yamasaki had designed together and invited HOK to present credentials. There's a lot of funny stories about it, but basically we won that job on the condition that we open an office in either Dallas or Fort Worth and we picked Dallas. So within a couple of years, of my joining, HOK was then operating almost as a national firm with offices on both coasts and two offices in the in the middle of the country with more to come. So full location diversity, the, uh, the principles are in full effect. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the next episode to learn more. What were the lessons that you wanted to share as takeaways for this episode? Well, I think there are three. The, the first one is that you have to have some kind of a commitment to innovate. If you want to build a firm that outlasts the founders, you better have a good reason for it. If you just want a job and you want to feed yourself and clothe yourself, you probably shouldn't be in architecture in the first place. So you have to have a vision. Helmuth had that in the way he wanted to put this firm together. And then he encouraged it inside the firm where each one of the partners, the three had a spirit of innovation that was flourishing in their own group. Second one is, I think that they all had, all three partners wanted to grow. And Helmuth made sure of this before he invited them to be his partners. He he had had that experience with Yamasaki, not really wanting to be flying around the the world to different HOK or different Yamasaki offices. So George Kassebaum and Gio Obata both agreed with George Helmuth we, sh- you know, there's an opportunity in every place for every kind of building. We should grow. We're building a new kind of firm that will flourish in- with this new strategy. And then finally, to glue it together, is this strong internal culture, the HOK culture, which is we're going to collaborate and we're going to be best friends, help each other, collaborate inside in order to compete outside. To continue the story. Come back next week for the next episode of Build Smart, where Patrick discusses his early days at HOK and his growth to become a leader at the firm. I think that was always inside of me, even though I wanted to be a designer. I also was always a very organized person from a young age. So a natural evolution occurred where I became really interested in this. And you know, Mark, if you're interested in something, and you're given an opportunity to let your interest mature, you can become, you can evolve into something else. We're not all going to be designers. So I became a de facto manager of small projects at first and then larger. And finally, the day came that Bill Valentine and one other leader in the office pulled me into Bill's office and said, Patrick, we've been noticing you and you've turned into a very good young project manager. And it seems to us that this may be your real calling. And we we want you to think about whether you would like to change at this point, because your design is still good. If you want to be a designer, we're not going to tell you you cannot. But if you decide that you want to be a project manager, we will support that and you can manage, but you'll be at a fork in the road. You can't do both. Thank you for listening. To read along and see illustrations and personal photos that accompany this series, get Patrick's book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm.
I encourage you to go grab a copy today and follow along as we continue the story. It's available now at gablemedia.com slash buildsmartbook. This podcast is a Gable Media production and is produced by Demetrius Lynch Jr. Gable Media is the home of curated thought leadership for an audience dedicated to building a better world. You can listen in, subscribe, and find more content like this from our network partners at GableMedia.com. That's G-A-B-L-Media.com.